How many of you guys remember getting tested for scoliosis in school by the school nurse? What were they looking at? And is it an effective way of diagnosing scoliosis? Yesterday, I presented the case of a 14-year-old girl who had a positive Adams forward bending test at school. She had never been screened before, and this is what she looked like when she stood up and bent over. She was then sent to her pediatrician where x-rays of her spine were performed that showed this. She has adolescent idiopathic scoliosis. This is an abnormal curvature of the spine that typically happens in late childhood or early adolescence. Instead of growing straight, the spine can grow side to side in an elongated S-shaped form. The bones of the spine are also typically twisted or rotated. Adolescent idiopathic scoliosis typically happens during the growth spurt in childhood. It's called idiopathic because we don't know what typically causes it. It's the most common spine problem in children and it affects 2 to 3 percent of children in the United States. It's typically diagnosed between the ages of 10 to 18 because that is the adolescent window of the growth spurt and severe curves are affected in females 10 times more than males. We often use the Adams forward bending test to help identify children that may be at risk. There are five things that we look at in the Adams forward bending test. First is looking at the patient's shoulders. The second is when the patient leans forward to look at the rib orientation. When you're behind the patient, you can look at the shoulder blade orientation as they're standing up and leaning over to see if there's an abnormality. And by looking at the patient from the side, you can identify what's called a hunchback to help diagnose Shoreman's kyphosis, which is another type of scoliosis. You can see on our patient's x-rays that she had curvatures that were measured 58 degrees and 36 degrees, and these are called Cobb angles. We measure the Cobb angle by finding the most tilted vertebrae above and below the apex of the curve. You draw a line straight out from the superior end plate of the top vertebrae vertebrae and the inferior end plate of the bottom vertebrae. Then we draw 90 degree angles from each of those lines. Then where those two lines intersect is our Cobb angle. See kids, geometry is important. Our patient's thoracic curvature is 58 degrees and her lumbar curvature is 36 degrees. A Cobb angle of over 10 degrees is defined as scoliosis. So what do we do with those numbers? There are a variety of factors that go into determining what the growth progression of the curve may be. That includes the patient's gender, the time that they had their first period, growth potential, and the magnitude of the curve. We need to know what the skeletal maturity status of the patient is, and we use something called the Risser scale. Here's one way we can assess this by looking at the skeletal maturity or the ossification of the iliac crest. There's also another method called the Tanner White House, which is a similar way of measuring bone ossification. Depending on the curvature, as well as the patient's growth potential, we can predict how quickly the curve may progress. Please note that this data is not conclusive, but it is a way that we can use to help predict. This is helpful for us to help predict whether or not the patient needs conservative treatment or referral to a surgeon for evaluation. So how do we know whether or not the patient needs to be watched, braced, or even needs surgery? Usually patients with minor curves less than 25 degrees can be safely observed. Bracing is usually attempted in patients with a curve from 25 to 45 degrees. It's usually most effective for patients that have a flexible curve and that are skeletally immature. Remember, the goal is to stop the progression of the curvature and not necessarily correct it. Obvious problem with bracing in this patient population is compliance or getting the children to wear this brace. Some studies suggest up to a 50% reduction in the need for surgery in patients that were compliant with bracing of over 13 hours a day. Operative treatment is usually recommended in patients with a curvature of over 45 degrees. Remember, our patient's curvature was 56 degrees. Her major curve is the thoracic deformity and the lumbar curvature is often called the compensatory curve. That means the spine curves this way to help keep the head aligned over the pelvis so when she walks, she walks straight up and down. So the goal of surgery is to correct the major curve or the thoracic curve because this curve will probably correct itself. I want to stress that surgical recommendations in patients with scoliosis is a very emotional decision. These decisions should be made between the patient's doctor, the patients, and the parents. Risks and benefits of correcting the deformity should be carefully weighed and decided upon. Long-term complications of not correcting a deformity in a child this young can be ongoing back pain and even pulmonary complications. In our patients, these decisions were carefully weighed and she underwent a scoliosis corrective surgery by a pediatric scoliosis specialist. Here you can see her post-operative x-rays showing the significant correction of her major and minor curve. And here is what she looks like after surgery. 
Patients this age recover remarkably well after this type of surgery. Our patient did great and was back to her normal activities in about three to four months. Remember, adolescent idiopathic scoliosis is only one form of scoliosis. I hope to go over several cases of scoliosis this month as it is Scoliosis Awareness Month. One of my passions in spine surgery is the treatment and management of spine deformity. Another case of patient-focused and compassionate care. Stay tuned next week and we'll go through another case.